it's time for another edition of the Collector's Corner. Oh, ha, and welcome to another edition of Collector's Corner, brought to you by our friends at the Sadistic Penguin Studio. I am your host, Aloha Mr. Hand, the man of notorious and questionable character, and I just want to go through some more memorabilia that I have just to show off in a way. Uh, I think it's cool. I think it's fun. And as you've, if you've played along while I've been doing this for a while now, you know that a lot of this was driven by the pandemic and me trying to get my arms around all of the stuff that I had. And frankly, some of it, I was like, wow, I didn't even, I don't even remember getting that. But why don't we go ahead and get started? Today's subject is tickets. Uh, I've collected tickets for years. Uh, mostly Sox tickets, uh, you know, White Sox games, Bears games, Blackhawks, Bulls. Uh, I've branched out a little bit and gotten some other tickets. A lot of them are ones that I got, but I also, when I see tickets that pique my interest, I jump on those too. So I'm going to start with with uh, some opening day tickets for the White Sox. Now, this one is a significant day in Chicago history. Not only because it was the White Sox home opener, but I was at the game, and this was the day Harold Washington was elected mayor of the city of Chicago, uh, April 12, 1983. I do remember chants of Harold breaking out at the game uh, because he was at, Harold Washington was at the game. Obviously, Harold Baines was there too, but it was sort of weird at first, like people are chanting Harold. I'm like, they're out in the field. Why are they chanting Harold? It's because Harold Washington was there. So there's the ticket from opening day 1983 against the Baltimore Orioles, who they would play later on in the year, and Tito fucking Landrum would break my heart. So moving on to another uh, opening day. There's been a lot of talk about a new stadium. You know, my opinions are pretty clear. I don't think the Illinois taxpayer, of which I am one, should pay a fucking dime. Uh, we have enough problems in this state that the money could go elsewhere. Uh, but I'm not going to go on a political rant about that or anything else. But once upon a time, there was a new stadium in Chicago. New Comiskey Park, April 18th, 1991. And you'll see I actually have three of them because I picked these up at a sale. Some guy was selling them. And I got the little... Tribune stand giveaway that they had for it too. Now, the game could be forgotten because it was 16 nothing Detroit. I think it was six runs in the third inning and 10 in the fourth. It was ugly. And let me tell you, I was in ugly shape too before I even before the game even started because my friend and I, my friend Tommy and I, went out and got annihilated that morning. The bars were open early and we were there. So Moving on. Now, this one is unique, and I know uh, guys like uh, Josh Nelson and, and King Nam will appreciate this because this is a San Francisco 49ers ticket autographed by Jerry Rice. Why? Not only is this a the game between the 49ers and the Bears in October of 1985. What's the exact date here? Is it on there? Oh, I can't see it. God, it sucks getting old. But... This was Jerry Rice's first career start. That's right. The GOAT receiver of all time. His first career start came against the 85 Bears defense. Now that's a something. Obviously, we didn't know what we were seeing at the time. I remember watching the game. I'm like, who's this fucking guy? But whatever. So moving on. Now, you know, going along the lines of opening day, uh, debuts sort of fit into that too. Uh, I might have, I believe I've shown this one before, but I'm going to show it again because I love it. I think it's cool, and that is, this is Frank Thomas's debut weekend in Milwaukee. As you remember, he debuted on a Friday night. First career hit was a triple. There's actually video of it on YouTube. You can go and watch. And he's wearing number 15, not number 35. This is from the Sunday game of that series in 1991. And he got his first career double and his third career hit. You see, Frank was nice enough to autograph it for me. And the scary thing is, he remembered. 
He told me what he did in this game when I had him autographing. Most players are like that. Now, a couple, the next few I know are not going to be popular with a certain segment of baseball fans in Chicago, a.k.a. Cub fans. But you know what? So what? This is a ticket from Game 4 of the 1984 National League Championship Series signed, oh, let me flip it the right way, by Steve Garvey, who had the game-winning home run with his arm up like this, running the bases, as the Padres drew even with two games apiece. And the next day, in Game 5, the Padres would finish the comeback. Steve Garvey also signed this one because he was the 84 National League Championship Series MVP. I know Cub fans, that prop, that one probably still hurts. That probably hurts you more than the Baltimore Tito Landrum shit uh, hurts me uh, from 1983. And then this game, this is another series MVP autograph ticket. Game 5 of the 1989 National League Championship Series, signed by Will the Thrill Clark. He absolutely dominated the Cubs. Him and Mark Grace both had great series. They both hit over 600 in that series. If Clark hadn't had the series he had, Grace would have won the NLCS MVP on a losing team. I know one other time that has happened, Fred Lynn in 1982 for the Angels against the Brewers. Lynn was dominating in that series, and the Angels went up two games to none, went to Milwaukee, lost all three. But Clark, in this game, Clark seals the MVP in the bottom of the eighth inning off the wild thing, Mitch Williams, when Clark absolutely smokes a single back up the middle to drive in the go-ahead run in the bottom of the eighth. Cubs came up in the ninth, couldn't do anything. Giants off to the World Series. And, of course, we know what happened in that World Series. Game 3 happened. What's Game 3 of the 1989 World Series? The Earthquake Game. Right, right here. The Earthquake Game. 5.06 p.m. Pacific Time, I believe, is the time. 7.06 here. I actually have videotape of it still. Yes, I still have videotape. I have videotape of it still. I was taping the game. You can hear Al Michaels say, I think we're having an earthquake. Then the screen goes black because they lost the TV feed. Um, the screen stayed black for a little while, and then next thing you know, a rerun of Roseanne is being shown. Uh, she's she gets mad in a restaurant and become you know goes up to gets coffee, and people think she's a waitress or something like that. But that's a significant because the World Series was postponed for about ten days uh, in that time frame, and. They resumed. The Oakland A's went on to sweep the World Series. So, speaking of World Series, next few are World Series related. Uh, so, arguably, the two greatest... Well, I don't think it's arguably. I think it is the case. The two greatest World Series of all time are 1975 and 1991. The 1991 World Series featured the young, up-and-coming Atlanta Braves at the beginning of their dynasty. Uh, 14 division titles in a row, so on and so forth. Uh, they squared off in Game 7, three games each, you know, tied at three games each. Home team winning all the games to that point. Only other time it happened was also with the Minnesota Twins in the 1987 World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals. But Game 7 was a classic. It was a masterpiece. It was the Jack Morris game. He pitches a 10-inning shutout to beat the Braves one to nothing. John Smoltz started that game, too, and I'd like to get Smoltz to sign this ticket. I just haven't seen him any place signing. Uh, and he was just as dominant. I mean, it was tied at zero. There was no score going into the 10th inning. That tells you how dominant both of those guys were. So... This is a masterpiece game. I believe MLB Network ranked it number two all time. What did they rank number one? Game six of the 1975 World Series, a.k.a. Stay Fair. Carlton Fisk waving it fair. Now, you may ask, what do I have here? This is what's called a proof, a ticket proof. It is not an actual game ticket. It is a proof of what the ticket will look like. This 
is an actual ticket. As you can see, it has seating on there and everything else. Now, the thing to remember about Game 6 is that it went 12 innings. It was also delayed three days due to bad weather in Boston. They sat around for three days and did nothing. So, uh, you know, and then the next night they come back, and that was October 21st, 1975. They come back on Octo October 22, 1975. Significant day, 30 years later, for Game 7 of the World Series. Pete Rose wins the World Series MVP. He got stronger and better as the series went on. And you can see the highlights of this series. One of the classic videos of all time is you see him sliding head first. I don't know how he did it. His chest must have been just tore up no end sliding head first all those years. Now, moving on. There's only one Mr. October. Mr. October participated in six World Series. Actually participated in only five but his teams were in six. I say that because in 1972, in Game 5 of the ALCS against the Detroit Tigers, Jackson blows out his hamstring in an Oakland A's victory, stealing home, and is unable to participate in the World Series, which the Oakland A's go on and beat the heavily favored Cincinnati Reds, a.k.a. the Big Red Machine, Bench, Rose, Morgan, all those guys, Perez, uh, in seven games. Uh, tight series. Only one game was decided by more than one run, and that was game six. Gene Tennis went absolutely wild, hit two home runs in his first two World Series at bats. Uh, first player to ever do that. Um, and won the MVP for that. But next year, Reggie came back with a vengeance. Won the AL MVP. Oakland goes back to the World Series against the New York Mets, who shockingly beat the Big Red Machine in five games. And I once asked Johnny Bench about why, how in the world did you guys lose to the Mets in 73? He said one word, pitching. The Mets had some pitching on that team. First off, your staff ace winning his second Cy Young that year is Tom Seaver. Not a bad place to start. You had Jerry Kuzman. You had John Matlack. They had Tug McGraw in the bullpen too, so... Their pitching was out of this world. But the A's won in seven games, actually coming back from a three games to two deficit to win game six and seven in Oakland. The deciding moment in game seven, a lot of people say it was the Campaneris home run. Fair, he did give them the lead. But then Jackson comes up with Rudy on, Joe Rudy on base and smokes his first World Series home run to clinch the World Series MVP. One thing also to remember about this series is Bill North got hurt and couldn't play center field. So Reggie moved from right to center and was filling in in center field for a lot of that series too. I'm sure that was a factor. Now speaking of Mr. October, this is the game that officially made him Mr. October. Three, he had four at-bats in this game. In the first at-bat he walked. Three swings after that, all of them gone. At that time, the only other person to do it was Babe Ruth. Not bad company. Pujols and Pablo Sandoval have done it since then. I believe those are the two that have done it since then. Now, this one, I mentioned earlier about Tito fucking Landrum. This is game one of the 1983 ALCS in Baltimore. Sox go into Baltimore, beat Baltimore 2-1. to one. Hoyt throws a complete game. Nobody was beating Lamar Hoyt that year. Nobody. The Orioles even knew it. I got Eddie Murray to admit to me that they had to win in four because they wanted no part of Lamar Hoyt in game five because they knew they were done. Sadly, it didn't get to a game five. Now, in baseball history, everybody knows about the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry. Oh my God, Yankees-Red Sox. Oh! One of my favorite moments of all time in this rivalry was a weekend in September in 1978. September 7th through 10th will forever be known as the Boston Massacre. The Yankees were went into the series down four games in the division, walked out of Boston on that Sunday 
tied. And it was not even close. I think it was like 42 to 6 were the number of runs put up in this series. It was a ma- it was a true massacre. The first game was like 15 to nothing, something like that. But I have ticket stubs for two of them. Now this one you'll see is dated July 4th, 1978. Was supposed to be played on July 4th, 1978. Rained out. So this was made up on September 7th, 1978, which was the which became the first game of the Boston Massacre. The schedule makers helped it Mother Nature helped the Yankees out on that one cuz they were playing they weren't playing bad, but the Red Sox were playing out of their minds uh, back in June and July, and they cooled off in August, and that's how that's how the Yankees were able to catch them. And partially, there's also, you know, I've also heard comments from some players that there was a newspaper strike in New York, so it was nice not having all of the media in the locker room while they were trying to make this comeback. So that probably helped them too. The next ticket stub is from September 9th, 1978. This was a pitching duel for the ages. It had Ron Guidry, who got his 21st victory in this game in one of the most dominant seasons a uh, pitcher has had in you know, the live ball era. He was like 25-3, and three, won the Cy Young easily. Uh, won his 21st game in this start against a future Hall of Famer in Dennis Eckersley. Yes, Dennis Eckersley was a starter for the Red Sox in 1978. He had just been traded there from Cleveland, where in 77, on Memorial Day, he threw a no-hitter. But he had just been traded there to start the 78 season, and he was basically the de facto Red Sox ace because he generally dominated the Yankees, except for here. Now, a couple more things real quick. Uh, A recent pickup I got. This is a Baltimore Orioles season ticket from 1991. You'll notice the date. August 11, 1991. Sunday at 1.35 p.m. What's significant about this ticket? Wilson Alvarez makes his White Sox debut with an ERA of infinity. He had made one appearance when he was with still with Texas before he got traded over. Didn't get anyone out. Gave up some runs, so his ERA was infinity. Obviously throwing a no-hitter. Lowers that ERA. Remember Lance Johnson making an incredible play in center field to save the no-no. Now, three tickets left. The first one is one of my favorite White Sox games of all time. It is Saturday, June 19th, 2000, June 18th, 2005. It is Turn Back the Clock Day. Anyone and everyone remembers this game from the 2005 season. That's because this is the game the White Sox wore the 1959 uniforms. They played Let's Go Go White Sox by Captain Stubby and the Buccaneers. And A.J. walked it off in the bottom of the ninth inning with the immortal uh, Ed Farmer call of This Place is Electric. That was this game. I tweeted A.J. a few weeks ago showing this ticket. I asked him if he remembered this, and his comment was, I think it ended with a walk-off. Yes, it did, AJ. Yes, it did. Now, two tickets left. 1985. The 1985 NLCS was a change in the way the NL, the S, the CSs work, NL and AL. They used to be five. That affected the Cubs in 1984 because it was only a five-game series. If it would have been a seven-game series, the Cubs would have come back to Wrigley for game six and seven and possibly won. We'll never know. But game five of the 1985 NLCS has one of the most famous moments in baseball history. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. Ozzie Smith jacks a home run batting left-handed to win the game in the bottom of the ninth. You can see Ozzie signed this for me. And put Go Crazy Folks with Game Winning Homer on there. I love this ticket. And I love the next ticket I'm going to show. This is Game 6 of that same series, the 1985 NLCS. I love this ticket because, and you could go look at this on YouTube. Jack Clark comes up in the bottom of the 8th inning and absolutely crushes a first pitch fastball. It's long gone to give the Cardinals the lead. Pedro Guerrero. Going back, throws his glove down like 
It was a Peanuts cartoon. Just... And it's hysterical to watch how he gets so angry and throws the glove down. But that's all I got. If you got any questions about anything, want to see something and ask me if I got something or some some player, you know, feel free to let me know. Thanks a lot for watching. That is it. And I am out of here. Bang.